So, uh, I want to tell you a little story. Well, first of all, it's in every magazine you pick up besides Sports Illustrated and The Enzyme, and I've written letters to both those guys to get that in there, and they haven't responded yet, so I'm, I'm counting on that. So, uh, this, this young couple in my neighborhood got married, and they, they, they were making this ham dinner, and, and the wife comes in, and she cuts off the ham, and she puts it in there, and cooks it, and makes it all nice, and the husband says, why'd you cut off the end of the ham? He says, I don't know, it's my mom did. She said, well, let's ask your mom. She said, mom said, why you cut off the ends of the ham? She said, well, I don't know, because my mother did. And that's the way I was taught. So they go back and ask grandma and says, grandma, why'd you cut off the ends of ham? She says, I don't know, because that's the way I was taught. And so they go back to grandma that's in the nursing home, and she's very feeble, and she can just barely talk. And she says, grandma, why did you cut off the ends of the ham? She says, well, because it wouldn't fit in the pan. And so many times, we do the same thing. You might have to turn off lights, maybe. We do the same thing. We do generations and generations of the same thing. I am the fifth generation farmer in the exact same spot that I am right now. We've been in this place for 130 years doing the exact same thing. And I, I grew up loving the soil just as my dad had taught me. You know, getting down and feeling it and touching it and rubbing in it and rolling in it and, and, and smelling it and seeing how great it was. And I did it because my dad taught me. And I did it exactly the same way he taught. We tilled the, the fields. We thought we had... We thought we were in heaven just thinking how great it was. Look, there's even a rainbow there. How great is this that we get to be here and we get to touch the soil and be a part of it and, and, uh, and do that. Five generations. You think it was easy for me to, to change and say, hey, guess what? We're not going to plow the fields anymore. That was a tough thing for us. Same place, same soil, only a little bit worse for 130 years. When in San Pete, we were pretty happy with anything grew down there because we're pretty... We homesteaded. I don't know why they stopped there. I think it must have been the ground that nobody else wanted. But we, that's where they end up stopping, so that's where we are. And I really felt like I loved the soil. I thought it was so great, and I just loved being a part of it. I loved being around it. And, and I didn't understand what was we were doing. We were ripping, and we were tearing, and we were slicing, and dicing, and crushing, and stomping, and doing everything we could to, to almost destroy the soil. And I didn't understand. I didn't know what we were doing to the soil. I thought I was improving it. I thought we had to do that to make a good seed bed so our plants would grow. I didn't understand. I didn't know. Uh, we're dairy people. Don't judge me. Uh, but this is one of the reasons why we started in a no-till. Uh, back in 2009, it was my farm, we had a real tough dairy year. So hay prices were really high. They were a little over $200 for a ton of hay. And we were doing fine and dandy, and all of a sudden the milk price dropped out. We bought all the hay we needed, and then we got $10 milk. And it was pretty devastating to us. It was, it was, it was a killer year. It's one of those years that you take on millions of dollars of debt. Not a single million of dollars, but multiple million dollars of debt. And we were, we were scared, and we didn't know what to do. And we were like, we've got to do something. If we're going to survive, we've got to do something. We've got to sink or swim. We've got to do something. So our plan was... Uh, we got to get more out of what we're doing. We can't get more out of the cows. We got to get more out of the ground. We got to have more forages. We got to have more production out of our ground that we got. We haven't got any more water. We certainly haven't got any money. And we got to use more than what we got right then. So uh, we decided to change our strategy. Uh, we threw the Hail Mary. We were, uh, we were going to do all that we could to do it. Uh, we. Uh, we decided that we were going to double crop, and we thought we'll just do it with the conventional tillage way we always had done. So we were going to work harder. We were going to work just all we could. We were going to just take after our corn come off, we were going to till the soil, and go right back into a three-way rotation, and plant that in and get that to come up. And then once that three-way comes off in the spring, we're going to go to corn, right back to corn. The problem was is we couldn't go through things fast enough. So our tractors, we wore out a tractor. We were running 20, 24 hours a day. Uh, tilling and ripping the soil, disking the soil, finishing the soil, leveling it, doing everything we could, and we couldn't do it. We wore out a tractor, we replaced it. We thought, well, our problem is we don't have big enough stuff. So we got a bigger tractor, we got a bigger ripper, we got a bigger disc, we got a bigger smizer. We did all this stuff and we didn't get anywhere. We just ended up killing ourselves off. We would work harder and harder and harder. I felt like the BYU football team this last year. They just worked hard and they got nowhere. They didn't do a thing. Uh, you know how that feels. We were exhausted. We were just give out and, and just discouraged. We come up with this plan. This is what we're going to do. We were determined to do it. Uh, 
Everybody's got a plan and everybody's got something that will work for them. Please don't think this is the only way. In our area, this is what we need. We need a lot of forage for our dairy. Uh, so we'd come up with this program. There's a lot of programs out there, but for us, this one really, really, really works for us. And we are so super pleased with what we're doing now. So we're gonna throw out compost. We got a lot of compost. We throw out compost all the time, every time we can. We're going to uh, uh, plant our corn. Uh, we want that corn planted in by June 1st. If we can get it done by June 1st, that's great. We want it to be harvested by early October. And then we're gonna put out compost again, of course. We're gonna do fall three-way. We want that planted by November 1st and uh, harvested by May 15th. Timing's pretty crucial. So if we spend all of our time tilling and working and breaking up the soil, we couldn't meet our deadlines. We couldn't meet our goals. It was, it was impossible for us to do that. We couldn't get to those, those dates and we ended up hurting our crops. Uh, we looked at the neighbors and the neighbors were doing a, a strip till program where they'd strip till their corn in the ground. And we thought, well, that's cool. Look at that. They don't have to do those five or six passes that we're doing. They're just doing one pass and they're planting. And this is a cool planter. This is a cool strip machine, I should say. If you look back there, it, it's kind of like in a, a tilled area about a foot to maybe 10 inches wide. The soil's kind of conditioned nice, kind of pretty, kind of looks good. We thought we had things figured out in that time, let me tell you. We got it really good. So we bought this machine. It wasn't cheap. Uh, set it up on our tractor. Of course, we didn't have enough money for, for green tractors. We had to sacrifice and have blue tractors. And uh, uh, we, this was a six-row machine, if you saw. And that's all that that tractor could pull. It was 200 and, that's a 260 horse tractor and it couldn't pull any more than that. So this one was a hard unit to pull and it didn't like rocks, it hated rocks. So we ended up trading that one away. And if you can see this one, this one's an orange machine now. Still the blue tractor, we didn't have that much money. Uh, so this is an eight row orange machine. It was easier for us to pull. We went to an eight row corn planter, which was we can get through things faster. Speed is a key to us being able to get through it quick. That's pretty important to us to get through things uh, in a timely manner. You've got to get it in early uh, to meet our deadlines so we can get the moisture and get everything taken care of through the winter. If you can get your, your three-way to come up and germinate and, and get through the soil in the fall, man, it makes a huge difference to your, to your crop, what it's going to be. Uh, we, we all went to, uh, our hope was that we had the, the chopper in the field, we'd have the compost throw in the field, We'd have the strip till machine in the field, and we'd have the planter in the field all at the same time. Now these, these are Snapchats from my nephews, and basically they're all GPS tractors, so they just have nothing to do but sit around and take pictures of each other and send them to each other. Look what you look like. And they, they just drive in circles. They don't have to steer. They just can't. They just fold their arms and sit there. So they're just uh, driving around taking pictures of each other. Uh, one of the things that we do try to do when we're doing this so we never till our, soil, our, till our fields again. We're done. We're, we sold the plow. That's over with. But if you look and see, there's corn stubble on the ground there, and he's trying to offset and be a little bit offset. So when we plant corn this year, it's gonna be, he's going to offset where he plants it next year so it doesn't disturb that root ball and that, that strip till. He's not going to mess it up. Finally, after all that, we finally get, get to the happy zone. Now we've got a great sunshine. Everything's happy. Yields are up. Things are doing great. Uh, we finally got it figured out. This, uh, when we figured out that we could do this with our strip till machine, and we were doing it in the, in, the, in the spring planting corn, it dawned on us, why aren't we doing it in the fall? Why aren't we doing the same thing in the fall and strip tilling, or uh, no tilling in the fall as well? So we, we did. We bought a no till drill. That's a John Deere 1590 drill. Uh, we researched it pretty good. I felt like that was one of the strongest, one of the best drills that are on the market. For us, that was, that was great. We, we uh, went to the bank and got a huge loan for a John Deere because that's what you do when you have John Deere. And, uh, but this machine is so great, I swear it would plant through the parking lot. It really can push into the soil. It's, uh, it has great uh, seed uh, down pressure. It can really plant through whatever we give it through. Uh, again, the timing was so, so important that we get it done quickly. This was, a, this was a miracle to us. Uh, if you can see, this is, a, this is a boy again. They have nothing to do. They're not driving. They're just taking pictures. But if you'll look and see up here, he's just planting. But you can see in the rows how he's planting along there. 
and see how it's like tilling into that soil and, and making a decent seed bed. And look how long that, those corn stalks are. We're not trying to get down and cut low. We're going to leave those corn stalks. Not a problem at all. He's, uh, he's going to plant right through that. No issue whatsoever. It's about the only time my kids get tractor time. And so they get out of school so they can come out and drive tractors and plant. And they're pretty happy about it. This is uh, when we're harvesting our three-way off. Uh, this was, was so new to us. We were thrilled to death we were getting some good tonnage off this. Uh, we were getting 10 ton, 10 wet ton the acre off this, and we were happy. This, we've done some improvements. We've improved some things that we do. We're now getting 15 wet tons the acre. You know, that's pretty cool, and it, really we only have to water it twice. So the water management for us is a big, huge deal, because we're in Utah. Water's tight. You don't get water. So we are going to get all that water throughout the wintertime. We're going to save it up, and uh, we're going to water it in the fall once, get it coming to germinate up, germinate and come up through the soil. And then we're going to harvest it off one water turn, and it's harvested off by, by early May, and it looks like that. So the trucks can hardly keep up with it. It's just as heavy as it seems like as corn is. This is a picture of where we're, we're planting through the corn stalks. You know, look at that. If you can see through that, it plants right through it. It's going to plant right through that stubble, right through those corn stalks where they're at. You don't have any problem planting through that stuff. It's great. And we think, why did we plow? Why did we till up the soil so much before? Why did we break it all up? We didn't know any better. We didn't have any understanding of what to do in a better situation. Uh, you know, one of the things that, we, that scares us that we, we had to learn the hard way. We're not, not super sharp and not super quick to, to understand this. We didn't know who to talk to. But we learned how to, the hard way what to do. And one of the things that scares us is soil compaction. Okay, so... In, in 2014 and again last year, for us, when we harvested our corn, it rained on us hard in September. It rained hard. And then it froze. And for corn, or the silage we needed, moisture is critical. We had no choice but to go in and chop. So we chopped our fields, and then we'd get out, and we're like, what are we going to do? Do we dare go back in? Do we, do, we, do we go back in and rip up all that soil and all that life and what we've done doing? And our choice was not to. We did in 14, we did some small areas where the ruts were huge, and they still haven't recovered back to the point where, where they are, less the field that we didn't till. And if you'll think about it, have you ever pulled your car onto the lawn and washed your car? Maybe they don't do that up here, but in our area they do that. They'll wash your car on the lawn, and you, you come off and you've got some big holes there, kind of where you park your car. It's the big compaction areas. Well, we certainly don't want to till up the lawn because it's got some holes in there. We know that it's going to heal itself and it's going to come back. We don't believe it's necessary to till the soil, even when you have compaction issues. We feel like you can do it and the soil will heal itself. It'll come back and take care of itself and uh, kind of come back to life. This is a picture of the three-way. This is my son. He's not bending down. He's about the same height as I am. That's me on the side. That's, it's coming up to my chin. So... One of the things we do struggle with a little bit in the springtime is it rains on us and gets us there a little bit, and that makes us some delayed. So that was a little bit delayed harvesting. It's later than we wished, but it's still, that's a lot of volume to me, and it's cheap to plant, and we just have recently learned that you can feed it to dairy cows very, very well. It is very palatable. Cows love the digestibility of it. They think it's great. Uh, super good for them. Great bonus for us to get that. Oh, oh, oh. I said I got to give a warning. Uh... So my wife says that I've really got a new porn in my habit. She says I'm just addicted and I'm nuts. And every time she picks up a, a device, it's got, it's got porn on it. She says it's terrible. She says she doesn't know what to do about it. She says I'm sharing it with my kids. And I'm a little bit embarrassed because I'm going to share it with you today. This is the sexiest picture I think I've ever seen. And uh, you guys are, don't go telling everybody that I'm sharing porn with you. But if you're addicted to it like I am, I'm telling you, it's just going to make you crazy. And I... I feel a little dirty showing this to you. Get that dirty. I'm just pouring in. So, look at this picture. This is, I don't know, I might have to step outside for a minute because this is a good stuff. If you look at this picture, this gets me so excited. Look, we're not trying to scalp, the, scalp it when we cut. We want to leave it up about six inches. There's no point in us trying to suck the dirt off the ground to try and do that. Leave it up off the ground a little bit. It's not hurting anything. Look in the middle here. You're going to see... 
some residue from last crop. That's from the three-way from the year before. Look over here, I can see some corn stubble where it's been smashed down in there, some corn stalks. Is it hurting anything? Not a bit. Look at that soil, look at how protected it is. Look at the armor that's on there protecting that. You can rarely see a little bit of soil here, a little bit of soil there, some here. A little tiny bits of soil is all you can see. That is awesome to me. That gets my motor running. When I see that stuff, I get so excited, I can't hardly sleep at night. And when I can't sleep at night, I'll turn on YouTube and look at some health videos, some soil health videos, because that'll help me. That is good stuff. Okay, I don't know if you've noticed it, but when you have soil covered like that, that healthy soil like that, you know how great that is? You don't gonna have any soil crusting. When we used to till our soils, our soils would always crust over and we'd have to water them or do something, run a tool over to, to break them up and to open them up, break down those, that crust. We don't do that anymore. Can you imagine what happens with evaporation with that? We rarely have, we, we still have evaporation loss, but it's not anywhere near like it used to be. You know what infiltration, how the water will infiltrate and go into that, how deep it will go into the soil, how quickly it will go into the soil. So you almost can, you can put almost as much water as you want on that and it doesn't run off the fields. One of the problems we had when we first started uh, some new ground was is you could, you almost couldn't run the pivots fast enough because the water would run off the fields and now it doesn't run off the fields. Now you can put it on there deep like you need to, two, three inches at a time at a pass, and it'll hold it and not run off and be utilized by the plants like it needs to. Uh, one of the things that we also started to notice was our weather, our weather seems to change. It's not like it used to be. So in the springtime when I watch all my neighbors, my, my farmer neighbors behind, beside of me, till their soils and work all the soils up, you'll see the dust come up off there and you'll see it rolling up off way and, and you'll see the winds come by and it blows it away and it blows it away and it blows it away. And A neighbor of mine, uh, he tilled his fields and let them sit all winter long and then he was waiting in the springtime to plant corn and the winds came and they blew and they blew and they blew. And I asked him, I says, how much soil do you think you lost? He says, oh, hardly any, maybe, a, maybe an eighth of an inch. I said, well, it's an eighth of an inch, but is it, is it your best soil or is it your worst soil? And he thought for a minute, you know, it's, it's my best soil. That that's usually the highest is usually the best soil you have, and he had lost it to erosion. Well, we don't have much problem with that anymore. We never have dust rolling off our fields. It doesn't happen. We also, in the springtime when we plant our corn, a lot of times we have these extreme winds that come by, and that's, they, they would sandblast our corn. They would actually just destroy it. They would tear up the leaves. We don't have that anymore. The dust doesn't blow off our fields. It doesn't sandblast the corn. Our, our crops are better, our crops are healthier. We don't have those issues like that. I have a neighbor that uh, we have actually, <clears throat> excuse me. We weren't really super smart. We bought another dairy down the road, 20 miles down the road. And as I drive between the two dairies, there's a dry land farmer off the side of me and he does his traditional ways. He, uh, he tills his field and lets it summer fallow. So he tills it once. And then he has to till it again in the, in the middle of the summer to kill weeds. And then he tills it one more time as he prepares it in the fall to plant. So three times he's going to till that field. And I, I cry when I drive by his field because I see what it's doing to his soil. And I see how sad it makes me that, that he doesn't love his soil the way or he doesn't understand what he's doing to it. The storms will come and they'll wash and they'll run. The erosion will just pull off that heavy soil. And it just makes me sad for what he's going through, what he's doing to the soil. So there's your porn for the day. So We also love to do some, some cover crops. Whenever we can do a rotation of a cover crop, if water's tight, uh, we'll throw, we'll maybe abandon half of a pivot of corn and put a cover crop in there for us. And what a great rotation that is for us. If you can see, this is a mixture of our seed there. It's about, uh, I think there's 17 different uh, species of seed in there. And uh, we love doing a cover crop. Cover crops make a big difference for us. They do such a great job of, of helping the soil and building the soil. You know, I used, to, I used to, would really be happy if I could walk across my field and, and find an earthworm or two and think how healthy my soil was. When I started doing cover crops and, and doing my double cropping system, I started seeing more life in my soil, more worms and more bugs, more insects, more things out there. So I got to the point where I thought, you know what? I'm just going to see. And I got my family out there and I said, I'm going to give every, each of you a shovel 
And any one of you that can come up with a shovel full of dirt that doesn't have a worm in, I'm going to give a dollar. And so they were out there for a, a long time trying to get money. They were going to earn this money. They thought, my, especially my girls, they were excited. They were going to get a lot of money off of finding shovelfuls without worms. I gave up $5 that day because they, I think they just, you know, tried hard or picked them out or whatever it was. But I learned, you know what? I shouldn't really be happy with one worm in a shovelful. My goal ought to be five, 10, 15 worms in a shovelful. That's where I ought to be. That's what I ought to be shooting for. So I'm really not happy with one worm anymore. I think we got to do better than that. We got to do better than one worm at a, a place, more life into the soil. Uh, you know what? And we've, we've had a lot better luck with summer cover crops than we do winter ones. We've tried winter ones, and every time I do it, I just can't seem to get the results. They can't seem to get up go fast enough before they, they get going. You know, like they talked about today, cover crops seem to do good with when they have more varieties, more synergy. They, they work together. Uh, you know, that there's a story of a, of a horse pole. And if you had these great big giant horses and they were pulling and they, they knew this one horse could pull a thousand pounds and they knew this other horse could pull a thousand pounds and they thought, well, let's put them together and see what they can pull. Well, logically, it'd be 2,000 pounds, but no, they can pull 4,000 pounds. So you see a lot of synergy when you get putting things together. Instead of them going against each other and competing against each other, we saw a lot of synergy. A lot of them working together that way. Uh, we had a field day there. We had some uh, people come out. We looked at it because they all thought we were nuts. They thought we were stupid. We planted in, you know, sunflowers and radishes and turnips and clovers and everything you could think of. And people thought we were crazy because we were kind of the first ones around that did it. So everybody wanted to see what was happening. So we had to have a field day so they could see what we'd done. Uh, this is a radish and turnip. Can anybody tell me which one's a radish and which one's a turnip? Good. Good. Excellent. Okay, so... The turnip on the, on the right hand was one that actually missed the spray and it kind of got left over for the year, it wintered over. That's not really one of my exact ideal ones, but man, they can grow. And man, what that does to the soil. If you can look at that, that on the left there and see if you could think of that just decomposing in the soil, that's like the perfect shape of a funnel. So all the water and all the nutrients, everything that comes to that is going to hit that funnel and go right into the soil. And... How awesome of that is to break up the soil, to help me to, with my compaction issues, to open that up, to uh, break open that soil. I think it's so funny that we would work so hard and we would try so hard to, to, to till the soil and do what all these plants can do for free for us and do easier and better. You know, when we were plowing and tilling, we were doing great. If we could get down 12 inches, 14, sometimes 16 inches, we could get down in. These plants will go so much deeper than that and so much easier. No horsepower, just getting the job done. This is more typical what we saw, what we typically see. Uh, the radishes and the turnips do a great job. They're some of my favorites. I love peas. I love legumes. Clovers are awesome. We want to do something to put life back into the soil. To me, if you think of, of the soil like a bank, and so often, we were taking and taking and taking away from the, from the soil. We were taking withdrawals of the corn. We were taking withdrawals of the three-way. We were taking withdrawals of, of alfalfa when we had alfalfa. We were taking all these withdrawals, and we weren't really putting anything back. So if you were to think about it, what are you guys doing for the soil? What have you done for the soil in the last five years? You know, we put out manure. We did that. We didn't increase our organic matter by much by doing that. We increased some of the life and some of the microbiology. But we were determined that we needed to put life back into the soil and put something back into the bank. So there was something there when the times were tough. And our way of doing that is a good cover crop. We really love cover crops. Uh, this is one of our favorite things, making compost. I think you guys all should have a dairy just so you can make compost because it is so much fun. I'm serious. This is the bomb. This is a great thing to do. Uh, you know that you're, you're building something that you're going to put back into the soil that's going to be absolutely fantastic, that you're going to build the soil with. So exciting to do this and to build a good product. Serious. Consider getting a dairy just for that. We don't care about the milk. We just want the, the compost. We love to throw compost. Kids love to throw compost. It's exciting for them. Uh, get a spin it. Go around. Um, 
Sometimes we'll do it in the wintertime when the ground's froze if we can't get done fast enough. Uh, our May and our October are, are hectic, crazy, busy. We really push hard because that's the time we're harvesting and planting and harvesting and planting. And then the rest of the year, you know what? It's not bad. We get to enjoy the year. Some of the soil health principles that we wanted to establish and, and make goals in our farm, these are things that we felt like were important to build back our soil and to make sure that we can pass it on to the next generation. One of the greatest things that we want as parents and fathers and, and, and farmers is to be able to pass it to the next generation, that they're excited enough, that there's enough left for them, there's enough money in the bank that they can keep going. And I'm talking about soil when I say money in the bank. Okay? We want to disturb the soil as little as possible. We sold our plow and told our kids if they want to see a plow, they better go to the museum because that's the only place you're going to see them pretty soon. They're going to be gone. So we don't have a plow anymore. It's gone. Uh, we did keep our, our disc. So because my mother still has to have her garden disc, that's what she wants to do. And, you know, it lets the kids have a little recreational tillage. It lets them drive a tractor. It makes them have fun. It lets them think they're great. So we do, we, we've gotten rid of most of our uh, tillage equipment, but we have a little bit to play with. We like to keep the soil covered. So we don't ever want to see bare soil like we showed you in that picture. And we always want to have a living plant in the soil. For us, we don't, we will harvest off the three-way, the, the, the plant's still alive. We're going to plant in our, our corn, and then we're going to kill the soil. Then we're going to come back in and terminate that plant. So we only have about a week in the spring and a week in the fall that we don't have a living root in the soil. And we believe it makes a big difference to our soil. Uh, we like the, the rotation that we're doing. We like to uh, throw in the cover crop there every time we can. We love cover crops, and we love the rotation that we're doing now. It's nice to have a, that nice fibrous root system going out, working in the soil. We know there's good benefits from that. And we incorporate livestock when we can. We've not been very successful with that. We can't seem to get neighbors. If we get, if we get a herd of sheep on there, man, you can't get them off. They don't want to leave. They want to trample it. They want to go too much. And the cows are not there. Usually in the summertime, the cows are up on the mountains. And a Holstein cow doesn't like to, to pasture very well. Once you get turned loose, it just gets up in the morning and walks all day long until it gets tired and lays down at nighttime. So we don't pasture. But our hopeful thing is that we're throwing out compost and a lot of compost. So hopefully that's going to make our, our deal right there. So we make mistakes. We do some things that are a little bit odd. We, uh, we, we have some uh, errors. We get stuck a little bit. Just like we all do. We get stuck. We struggle. Uh, but we keep going on. We don't give up. We, we, we work through it. And we were determined enough to stay with it and keep going. Uh, you know, when I, when I discovered about soil health, to me it felt like I walked out of a dark cave into the bright sunlight. It was almost blinding to me in my life. I realized that the soil was alive and not just some inert product that grows seed. You don't just grow, a, you know, water a seed and have it grow. But it's alive and it has so many millions and billions and trillions of microbes in it that are really helping out. They're doing so good for us. Uh, and we need to keep those things alive. And they're going to be just like us. Now, all those microbes, all that life in there needs things just like we would do. We need food and we need shelter and we need clothing and we need air and water. We, can you imagine not having food? That'd be the pits if you only had one food all your life and you couldn't change. You, couldn't, you had to eat macaroni and cheese for every meal for the rest of your life. That'd be the pits. So do a cover crop. Shelter, that's their home, the place that they live, the place where the, all that microbiology is at. Can you imagine some of them like it high and some of them like it low? And if we go in there and till it and roll it all over and tear it all up, it's like tearing down the house. That's terrible to do to our microbes. They hate that. Of course, they need water and they need air. Well, we don't want to aerate people. That'd be terrible. We don't want to aerate bugs either. That'd be terrible things to do too. You'd think that you become mass murderers. You're out there with your, ta your tractor and your disc and your plow and you're mass murderers, tearing up all that soil and tearing up all that life. We're getting too, I'm running out of time. Uh, I'm not really a slow learner, and I'm not really a fast learner. I'm more like a, a half-fast learner. So, but even being a half-fast learner, I can see the benefits of, of, of no-till and, and limited till. Uh, this is my son this week. He was still to death. He felt like he's the king of the world, like he's living the dream. That, to me, is the greatest thing ever that I get to have that, to have that boy come back and want to be a part of this. Some of the benefits for us are as, as rocks. 
We used to pick a lot of rocks when I was young. We don't pick rocks anymore because we don't pull them up out of the ground. Uh, our soil never crusts. Uh, we talked about the sandblasting. We, our, soil, our plants don't get sandblasted. Our, our soil is easier to till. It's more workable. It's more loose. It's, uh, you don't pull up clods. You know, this last year when we had all that compaction and all that corn that was, that was harvested, they, they packed the soil. My neighbors were pulling up big dirt clods, big, huge things, and they were taking their tractors over in three and four or five times, three miles an hour, because they couldn't get going any faster trying to break up those big clods. We don't do that. We don't have to deal with that. Insecticides. We rarely, we haven't done an insecticide in probably six years because we don't need to. The other bugs, the, the better bugs are uh, overtaking them. We graveled all of our pivot tracks. We fill them in. We don't ever get things stuck anymore. We don't ever have to till. We don't have to worry about that. We have so much more time now to deal with. We have, we're so happy. Uh, wives let us sleep in the house again. They're happy to see us. Uh, only bad thing is you have to do their honeydew project now all the time. That's, you know, a downfall. Uh, we, we use less fertilizer. We're, we're making our soil significantly better. We're changing our soil pH. We're changing the C to N ratios. We're seeing some differences in our soils. We see the erosion has drastically stopped. We, just, we hardly ever, ever, ever have a storm that creates erosion. One time, I think two years ago, we had some soil that got wet and was frozen, and it warmed up so fast that the water ran off because the ground was frozen. That's the only time we have water running off our fields. We don't ever want to see water come off our fields. We always want it to go in. Our infiltration, our holding capacity of our water is so much better. If you can picture a giant sponge just sucking it in and holding it till we need it. Uh, our health has improved. Our soil health has improved. It's significantly better. Uh, you know, our yields are better. We used to, uh, I recognize if I say my yields, you guys will kind of mock me because you're up here in a really good country where it's really good weather, really good soils. But uh, we're getting, we used to get average 20 ton corn was, an, was a good for us. This last year we got 28 ton. We believe we're going to get 30 ton this year. Even with a tough situation because our soil health is so much more improved. Our, uh, the organic matter in our soil is improving. The Perhaps life in our soil. In hey, I'm not done. I already knew I had to watch you. <laughs> I got things to go on here. Our organic matter has significantly improved. We know the importance of the organic matter in our soil. We've increased our carbon and we've increased the life in it. Uh, even though we're removing all the forages, we've still increased the, the organic matter in our soil. Uh, and all types of tillage is going to hurt that organic matter. So if we stop that, so we're happy. And one of the last things is our money. You know what? I don't know about you, but my wife really loves money. I don't, I just as soon have a tractor, but she loves money. And it's so much funner to, to sign the backs of the checks than it is the front of the checks. My John Deere rep told me, he says, if you're going to buy a new tractor, you better plan on $1,000 per horsepower. Okay, so a 200 horsepower tractor is going to be $200,000. 300 horsepower, $300,000. If you go buy a new pickup, you'd be doing good if you find one for $40,000. If you go out to the store and you're going to buy some fuel to put in that, it's significantly more than it used to be. Your fertilizer, significantly more. Your seeds, significantly more. But a lot of times yet, our finished product is not more. We've got to figure out a way. You're going to have to make get that point where you're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to do something to make a difference. So right now, I used to always put like 700 hours a year on a tractor. That was standard for us. Now I put around 100 hours a year pl uh, planting, just usually planting, throwing compost. Well, you think, well, that's not a big deal, but okay, in 10 years, I was wearing out a tractor every 10 years about that. 10 to 11 years, I'd wear one out. And now in 10 to 11 years, I'm going to have 1,000 hours on that tractor. My kids will most likely never wear out a tractor. Can you imagine that? In 100 years, they'll have 10,000 hours on a tractor. That's kind of odd. You won't have to replace one. Of course, you will because you want you know, that new tractor. But you don't have to. You're getting rid of all that equipment, all that, those, those uh, plows and discs and levelers and tillage and, and those smi uh, smizers and dominators and all that big horsepower stuff. You don't need any more. I had a good friend of mine down the street that had, had like 400 acres and he had one tractor. And he, he sold it. He retired last year and the tractor had 7,000 hours on it. And he'd done it for 40 years. So you don't have to have all that. He's saving a ton of money. Uh, you don't have the interest, the insurance, the, de the depreciation, the storage, the repairs, the maintenance. Uh, we don't burn through the diesel. We don't do the man, man hours. We let some people go because we don't need them that much. We don't have to go through that much anymore. All we needed was the planters and the harvesting equipment. Uh, and honestly, even if, you, 
even if your yields were less, even if you yield less then than what you do now with, with no-till, you'd still make more money because you don't have to have all those expenses. You don't have to worry about replacing a tractor every few years. You don't have to worry about uh, the diesel and the fuel and, and uh, all those things. You're going to make more money even if you don't. But here's the bonus. You get to make more money because your yields go up. So it's a double-double. You guys have got to come to that point where, there's a, where you, you've got to figure out something that's going to make it better, something that's going to improve your soil. For us, it was being backed into the corner where we had no other choice. So I hope you guys don't get to that point where you have to be backed into a corner to make a decision. Try and make a small change. Take a piece of your ground, maybe a, a small section or a small field, and you're going to say, you know what, I'm going to try this no-till on that. I'm going to see what it does, but I'm going to do it for a couple years. And don't give the crappy part of the field. Don't give the outside pivot corners. Do the good part and get in there and try a little bit. Experiment and talk to people and, and find out what's happening. I really believe it. I know that no-till is going to work. We will be no-till for the rest of our lives. We are not going to change from what we're doing. It's put the fun back into farming for me because I get to experiment and see new things and try new things and look for new things and scratch my head and try and figure out a better way to do it. Just like what, what they were talking about earlier. Let's see what would happen if I planted peas with this or what would happen if I changed and did something different that, that brought out a different result. All the time thinking about it, uh, looking at that porn at nighttime, looking at that soil health stuff. Pull it up on your iPads and it gets addicting because there's millions and millions of things out there to look at and see. Try it. Try it and see what it does. Don't give up on it. Be easy. And, and seriously, there's so many different ways to do it. This is just the R system and what works good for us. But man, there's a lot of different ways out there that people can do it. And, uh, and just give it a good try. And uh, here's my family. Uh, there's a little pet raccoon over there in the corner. And uh, that's a daughter that helped me build the program. And thank you. That's all I got.